Okay, one over there. So please say who you are and where you're from and try and keep your questions obviously um, short so we can pack as many as possible in. Sir. Okay, I'm Barry Hancock, originally from Stoke-on-Trent. Um, I'm just, I, I suspect it might be a little bit early to ask this question given the state of the analysis at the moment, but I'm wondering if you're hopeful um, about establishing deuterium content in H2O. I'm thinking in terms of the um, proposition that comets might be a major source of our oceanic water. Um, well, well, I can uh, answer some of that. Um, the Rosina instrument, which I, which I talked about, which is not our instrument, but it's based on, on the orbiter, has already made some uh, deuterium hydrogen measurements. Um, but of course, they are from afar. It would, it would be very nice to make the measurements uh, on the ground. And certainly, our instrument is capable uh, of doing that if we can drill a sample and, and, and get, it, get it into the body of the, of, of the instrument. Um, the measurements that have been made so far uh, show that the DH ratio is about three times um, what it is on, on the Earth. So what does that mean? Does that mean that the, the water on Earth didn't come from comets? Well, of course, um, it couldn't all have come from comets like that. Otherwise, it would be the same isotopic composition as the, uh, as the comet. Um, but I think these are still early days, and um, you know, the, 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 certainly the Rosina instrument will continue to keep making measurements now for months on end. So um, we, we'll see how that see if it, it changes uh, over time. Okay, uh, another question. Uh, yes, lady, there. Uh, just get the a mic to you. Um, I'm Rita Egan, and I live just down the road in Houghton Regis. Um, I was. I'm always fascinated by how far you can travel in space with very small equipment. Um, the last speaker intrigued me because I'm disabled. And to this day, I can't find a piece of equipment that's light enough to allow me to travel around the world and put my equipment into a car without fracturing my spine. And I would have thought that by now, and I, what I would like you to do is to actually look at all the needs of disabled people with the research that you've done, because a lot of our equipment really is, is almost 19th century. I just wondered if you might respond to anything that you know that you about that might help us. Mm. Well, to bring it back to the dogs and the sniffing analogy, uh, one of the, the medical detection dogs in Milton Keynes are actually used to... Uh, pick up people having episodes of fits, whether that be diabetes or other kind of things. And so the dogs are incredible. They can inform the, the owner, basically, before they actually have, an, have a problem. And one of the things we're interested in looking at is whether or not we can use the dog as a scientist. So currently, we don't know what the chemical signatures the dogs are picking up are. So can we put Ptolemy-type technology onto a dog, and the dog switches the machine on because they know the person's about to have an episode? Can we then analyze the samples in the laboratory and build a portable system that could then be used by these people? Instead of having a dog, you could actually have a machine that you wore and picked up the same signatures. So we are starting to do it, but you're right, there's, there's plenty of activities. Okay. Uh, there's a question at the back, please. And after that, who else wants to ask right. a question? One in front. Yes, so one at the back. Hi, uh, Chris Holroyd. I'd just be very interested if you could... Talk a little bit about, um, as you see the comet uh, heading towards the sun, what, what analysis or what do, what, what do you expect to start happening from the, the, the orbiter and, and any analysis that uh, will, will come from the comet itself? Um, well, there's <coughs> from the, the orbiter, the, we're obviously immersed in the, uh, the coma, and um, you noticed in the image I took where the dust particles were being detected, there were essentially look like three different spheres of, of orbit. And that's because gradually with time, the spacecraft will pull away as the activity builds up. But of course, it will still be within the coma making measurements. So the kind of things that we saw from the dust experiments and from um, Rosina and the other uh, instruments measuring the composition of the gases will allow us to uh, essentially make measurements all around the comet of how the composition and the structure of the coma changes with time. That's something that we've never been able to do before. We've, we've had detailed measurements through five or six different comets with different missions, but essentially a snapshot at, at one moment. And of course, we, then, we don't know how those things uh, evolve. So what obviously 
um, you can do with the cameras is look and see if you can see changes on the surface because we want to understand how the ices evaporate again. Is it, will we actually see the surface eroding? Um, as an indicator, if you work out the mass loss from a comet and extrapolate that through the whole of the encounter around the sun, if it were measured all over, it might be about this deep across the entire surface. And yet we know that it probably isn't going to be active on the whole surface, and therefore certain areas, we're going to lose even more material than that. So you should be able to see real physical changes to some of these features on the comet as you go around. Of course, ideally what we'd like, uh, and uh, Ian I'm sure is hoping for, is that the sunlight on the uh, Philae Lander increases in intensity and time so that the batteries can be powered up and it can then uh, transmit back to the spacecraft. And then there's hope that we can make more measurements. Even if you can't dig into the surface, Ptolemy can, can make sniffing measurements and again see how the gases that are being released from the surface uh, are evolving. And if that ice wall gets hot, that's going to vaporize and we could very, see very exciting things. It may even launch Philae back off the surface again. <laughs> um, so <laughs> there's, you know, there's, there's, uh, the thing is, because we've never seen this process close up before, we don't know what's going to happen. And I'm sure you know, we can all project, but actually what will happen will be something different and exciting. And, um, and we're just looking forward to that over the next few months. Gentlemen in front. Thank you for this opportunity to, to come here and listen to you guys talk about this amazing event that's happened in our lifetimes. I've, I've always just wondered, there's two things, two parts to my question. I've always just wondered, so you've got all this um, information. You've now worked out how the solar system was formed or how comets are formed. What are you going to do with all that information? You're not going to be able to change things. But then I was much encouraged by the last speaker and the things that we are able to do with the technology that we sent out into space. And I was just wondering, you know, I, I know in the Middle East they're trying to um, work out a person who's a suicide bomber and he walks through a checkpoint and they're able to somehow detect from a, some sort of chemical signature on that person whether he's carrying a, a munitions. Are you going to be able to take this for, for us? So that, because it, it looks like sort of this kind of violence is spreading to Europe as well now. Do you think this is something you would consider using your technology for? Okay, uh, pretty big question there, but... <laughs> <laughs> we have looked at it, yes. And... Um, the reality is there are better detectors out there. So again, it's, it's very important to realize what the strengths of our systems are and potentially what the weaknesses are. The beauty about mass spectrometry is it sees everything, but the weaknesses, it sees everything. <laughs> so you have to build the inlet systems. By building an inlet system, it makes it more complex, and there are other solutions out there that are, that are more appropriate. Okay, any other questions? Can, can I, can I oh, yeah, please yeah, go uh, ahead. There's in. another aspect to, to this. Um, and that is by learning about um, comets, what they look like, uh, what they're made of, and all this kind of stuff. I mean, we're interested in it for its pure academic reasons. I mean, Taps obviously crossed the wall and wants to make millions, but uh, <laughs> um, he, he started on this side, you know. Um, <laughs> but, you don't pay me enough. <laughs> but um, you, you can see, I, I don't think, you know, you don't need to be an expert to realise that this comet is going to split in half at, the, at some point. May, maybe not on this passage, but, uh, but eventually it will do. So comets uh, are, are doing some strange things. They're very dynamic and, and very active. And clearly, uh, over the history of, of the Earth, they've impacted the Earth. Now, you can imagine, you saw that thing on the top of Milton Keynes there. I, I, it just missed Netherfield, by the way, which is where I first yeah. lived in Milton Keynes. But, but clearly, if something like this comes down onto the Earth, it, it will... Probably, probably do for civilization. I mean, quite apart from the specific thing you, you, you were asking about. So understanding what the enemy looks like in terms of comets is actually quite important. And I think uh, progressively, you know, eventually our civilization will face an, a threat that we can track and we'll know that a body's going to come and hit us. We can, we can do those calculations and make the measurements. By knowing something about what it looks like, we may be able to design the mitigation strategies to deflect it or whatever it is. Sounds a bit science fiction, but it, it clearly will happen for a, a technological civilization like ours. Okay. Time for one last question, maybe. One up there. Excellent. Yes. Uh, say who you are and where you're from. Hi, my name's Jason. Um, I'm from Milton Keynes. Um, I'd just like to say, uh, well, a couple of things, really. First of all, training dogs to be scientists. Thank you very much. I'm going to remember that for a long time. That's brilliant. <laughs> um, 
Um, second thing, I just wondered um, what um, future events um, are on the horizon that get you, mm. get you guys excited? Good question. Well, um, in terms of Rosetta, the, the important thing to remember is the mission continues now for uh, at least to the end of this year and probably into next year. One of the next uh, exciting things is, well, hopefully, um, in the coming months, the, the sun reaches the, the shaded place where Phil A is, and we have a chance to, to operate that again. Um, then, whether or not uh, Phil A wakes up, the comet reaches its closest point to the sun in August this year. Uh, and then, at this point, you know, the illumination is at its most, the activity of the comet is at its greatest, and at this point, the, all of the, the instruments on board the spacecraft are going to be measuring lots of different species all over the comet and, lo and looking at different areas of the comet and how they react to this intense sunlight. So that's one of the, the major highlights. Um, then as we go into next year, a, the comet is, at the moment, uh, as seen from the Earth, the comet is behind the sun. Whereas later this year and into next year, the comet will be visible to telescopes on the Earth again. And that gives us a unique opportunity to uh, combine measurements from telescopes looking at what we think the comet is made of and how we can measure things from the ground with these measurements in, in space. And that's a way that allows us to test all of um, the methods that we use to study other comets, uh, to get a real calibration, a ground truth, as it were, to things that normally you can only look at uh, from a great distance with telescope. So as someone who observes comets with telescopes, that to me is a, a very exciting element of the mission to come. I, I I'd like to comment on a, a slightly longer time scale. Um, actually, I started working on um, well, the precursor to Rosetta in 1986. Gives you a feel for how long these missions mm. go from the very earliest planning stage to, to fruition. And so, of course, while that's going on, you're not just thinking about that one mission, otherwise your career would be one thing. Um, mm. You're always thinking about the next and the next and the next. And, and one of the aspects of this is, of course, that we have many fantastic ideas um, and many more ideas than there are pounds to pay for them. Um, uh, but so there's a great deal of competition in proposing the, the, the kind of missions that might actually eventually get selected and, and, and fly. Um, but both Colin and I are involved in, in um, I would say, competing proposals for the next round of European Space Agency selection. And so we're already thinking ahead, actually, to missions that will be launched in the 2020s. Um, and uh, from my particular interest is in the other kind of objects um, for that mission that, that uh, form close to the sun. So comets are the small bodies that make the building blocks of planets in the outer solar system. Asteroids are the building blocks of, of planetary material in the inner solar system. And um, small asteroids are, are, are the other half of the impact hazard, if you like, uh, to the Earth. So understanding that half of the risk is, is very important too and we're uh, planning and proposing uh, a, a European mission. There's already an American mission which is going to be launched in a couple of years time and a Japanese mission which has just been launched to the most primitive kinds of asteroids. And in fact those asteroids contain um, material that we think has the D2H ratio that matches the Earth's oceans and it may be that asteroids actually provide a significant amount of the water. It's a very uncertain question at the moment. So there's lots of interesting science, um, but there's also a kind of um, a, a feeling that we're doing something basically to save the world ultimately by trying to understand these bodies because it's know your enemy when the one that's going to hit us will eventually hit. Um, it, hopefully not anything in any of our lifetimes, but ultimately it will. Can I just say from my perspective, um, the next challenge I want to get involved with is one that doesn't take 20 years. <laughs> so um, we, we're, actually, um, we're actually looking uh, to build instruments now to go to the moon. I interestingly, the moon has become back on the agenda as a really interesting uh, object and, and, uh, and uh, you can get there in three days. So, you know. <laughs> uh, I've got three, I think. One is counted by millions. <laughs> Unlikely. Um, two is obviously the cancer project. It would be fantastic if at the end of this trial in probably three, four months' time, if we do have something that, that could make such a big difference. Uh, and finally is, is, is a project Ian and I are both working on, led by Andrew Morse, which is to look at making a micro-machine version of Ptolemy. So making the gas chromatography column the size of our fingernail. So then you really would have a handheld device 
which he could apply to whatever application. So there's a lot of barriers and other. Ta, ta, a that's a secret. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> you heard it here first. <laughs> Okay, well, thank you very much to our four speakers, Dr. Colin Snodgrass, Dr. Simon Green, Professor Ian Wright, and Dr. Guy Morgan. A prolific combination of academics from the Open University Space Science team. A round of applause.